Uh, very happy to have today Samuel Lloyd Hoyser from MIT, who will continue last week's discussion on emergent times in holographic duality. Please. Great. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction and for, for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about some work on emergent times in holography uh, that I've done with my advisor, Hong Lu, um, who gave sort of the first part of this talk uh, last Thursday. Um, so first, I'll just uh, recap a little bit of, of what he talked about uh, before before going into some some of the uh, things we'll discuss today. Um, so first, let's see. Um, there we go. So first, um, the the main the main issue that that we're interested in understanding um, is 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 sort of these bulk time evolutions that look like this. So so we're interested in understanding from a boundary perspective. How do we describe a bulk time evolution that takes some Cauchy slice like this through the bifurcation surface um, to another slice, you know, like this one that probes the interior of the black hole? Um, and so the simplest sort of setup that you can study this question um, is the eternal ADS black hole. Um, and you know, it, it's it's well known that this this is conjectured to be dual to uh, this the two copies of the CFT in the thermal field double state. And from the perspective of the, of the CFT, we have this we have this notion of time along the boundary, um, and we have this time-like killing vector outside the horizon that lets us, you know, sort of naturally extend this asymptotic time into the boundary or sorry into the bulk. Um, but that time ends at the horizon, um, and so you know if we do that procedure, we're not going to be able to probe the interior of the black hole, um, and and we won't be able to understand anything that's happening in these future or past interior regions. So we're interested in understanding, um, you know, how do we describe infalling observers? Um, and in particular, you know, if we have infalling observers from the left and the right side, and they can interact in this future region, how, how is that described from the CFT perspective? Um, and so last time, um, Hong, Hong should have shown that uh, we have, uh, we were able to, to generate, uh, we're able to, to find these evolution operators in the boundary that, that describe these kind of evolutions in, in a certain limit. Um, so there are evolutions that take, you know, observers who are living in this right exterior region across the horizon into the future, um, and then eventually ending at the singularity. Um, or, you know, equivalently, we can look at the Cauchy slices. If we start, you know, with this Cauchy slice through the bifurcation surface, then evolving by positive values of S, we get Cauchy slices that look like this, that are exactly this kind of evolution we were interested in that probe the interior region. Um, and so, you know, the, the description of these infalling observers um, has to do with the fact that in the boundary theory, you can actually find these evolution operators that look like this. There's a one parameter um, unitary group of operators. Uh, you've got this permission generator and that generator has the following properties. It involves you know, the left and the right degrees of freedom. This is what allows us to propagate inside the black hole. It's positive semi-definite. And um, and yeah, and importantly, as as I mentioned, um, you know, if we take some bulk field operator in the right exterior region and we evolve with this evolution operator, we find that you know th this operator at a later at a later value of the parameter for large enough values of that parameter s, this capital phi is supported in the future interior. Um, and so you know th these conditions are 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 interpreted in this way that this positive semi-definite condition distinguishes S as being some notion of time. It sort of distinguishes it from something like a spatial translation. Um, and then the fact that you know, an operator originally in the right uh, exterior becomes uh, supported in the future interior demonstrates that this is some sort of notion of infalling time. Um, and so then there's a sense um, in which we can take those operators in the exterior regions, evolve them with U of S, and generate the interior region. So it's kind of like we're generating the interior regions from the exterior regions. Um, great. So that's sort of a, a very fast summary of, of Hong's talk um, from last Thursday. Um, and so now uh, I'll just quickly outline what I'll discuss today. Um, so first, I'll give I'll give an argument that that there should be no notion of a sharp horizon. If you can't describe the notion of a sharp uh, black hole horizon at finite number of degrees of freedom on the boundary at finite n. Um, and, then, and then I'll do a bit of a, a mathematical review on, on, on our main tool, which is half-sided modular inclusion. Um, and uh, and, and I'll, I'll discuss you know, a few of the, the theorems related to that. Um, and, then, and then we'll use those properties to understand um, how, how exactly, you know, some, in more detail, some of the construction of these boundary operators, U of S. 
Um, and so and in the case of, of uh, a generalized free field theory, we'll actually find that you can extend this, this U of S um, in a nice way. And it's actually completely determined the form that these operators have to take is completely determined um, by uh, uh, up to a phase. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a universal form for these, the, these evolution operators in that case. Um, great. Um, and so yeah, I, I, yeah as, as I was mentioned, and, and as you heard last time, this is all uh, work with Hong Lu that appeared in these two papers. Um, so I'll just stop for a second in case there are any questions uh, before diving into this. Great, great. Um, so first we'll discuss, uh, we'll discuss an argument that there should not be a sharp horizon at a finite number of boundary degrees of freedom. So, um, so it, this is a, there, there's a puzzle that uh, was first pointed out by Merrill and Wall in 2012. Um, and it's related to the, to, you know, to the existence of this future region and how do we describe infalling observers in ADS CFT. Um, so first, um, yeah, so first, uh, this duality of the thermal field double and this ADS black hole raises a puzzle. So first, I want to imagine I'm only thinking from the boundary perspective. Um, so I can imagine, you know, constructing this state uh, in, in, the, in the two copies of the boundary theory, uh, where I've, act, I've acted some unitary on the left side on, um, on the thermal field double state. Um, and, then, and then I want to see, you know, can a, a measurement, uh, you know, can a measurement by a right, uh, an observer in the right, um, you know, who would be described by these these uh, CFT degrees of freedom on the right side, can they can they measure the effects of of that unitary insertion? Um, and of course, the answer is no, because you know that measurement operator from the right side commutes with this this uh, unitary insertion. So you know all of these expectation values are just the same as if there was no insertion at all, and the, and the left insertion has no effect on the measurement. Um, so that's from the CFT side. But this appears to be in, con you know, in conflict with this bulk picture. Um, and that's because you know, from, the, from the bulk picture, we expect that you know, the insertion of this, this small unitary on the left side, um, you know, it, it, should, it should have um, some effects in, these, in this left region. Um, and then those effects propagate into the future region. And if I have you know, my observer from the right falling into that future region, they can sense you know, those effects and they should be able to detect that, that this small unitary on the left was inserted. So this is what the bulk picture tells us um, that they have this detection. Um, and so this, this is, this is, a, uh, this is a, a puzzle that was first raised by Merle and Rall, um, but it's not, it doesn't directly lead to a, to a contradiction. Um, more, what it, more so what it tells us is that um, is that if we want to describe, you know, these observers falling into the interior of the black hole, then you know the description of those observers in that future region necessarily needs to include degrees of freedom on the left and the right CFT. Great, um, and so and so so now that we have that in mind, um, we'd like to understand, okay, what what uh, you know what form should the evolution of this observer take? Um, and, and what can we understand uh, from the evolution of that observer and asking these kinds of questions. Um, great. So first I'll just uh, in introduce some, some notation. So let's imagine that you know, we have our observer on the right side. We now understand that they're gonna evolve them into the black hole. And at some point, uh, you know, the, the description of that observer is going to have to have support on both the left and the right CFT degrees of freedom. Um, so, so let's imagine that you know the probability. Let's just denote the probability that this um, observer detects this insertion on the left by p of s. And so the bulk causal structure gives you this very clean signature. It says that p of s needs to be exactly zero um, for small enough values of the parameter because the observer hasn't yet crossed the horizon. But then after crossing the horizon, p of s should go to something non-zero. You know that insertion can be detected. So this is just you know, the mathematical statement that that observer can't detect the left insertion until they've crossed the horizon of the black hole. Um, so this is what we expect from bulk causal structure. Um, and so now um, recall that uh, as, as I mentioned a bit earlier and as Hong mentioned last time, we found these, these infalling evolution operators that take this form um, with that, that take the, this form of a one parameter unitary group. Um, and so, and so, if we're describing evolution in this way, then we well, then we want to ask, okay, what is the CFT description of of you know of this observer falling past the horizon? 
and trying to make this measurement. So let's imagine that the observer, you know, who's, who's originally in the right region, um, can can come up with this projector that they're going to use to make the measurement. So, so it's a specific projector that's been designed to measure, you know, to measure the effect of this excitation. Well, then as they fall into the black hole, they carry their projector with them, and and you know their projector evolves in this way um, as you know as the evolution is described by this U of S. So as they fall into the black hole, their their projector also evolves, um, and you know of course importantly will you will gain some support on the left theory. Um, great. Well, in that case, then um, then um, we can write the probability in this way. This is the you know the CFT formula for the probability. You know we take our state that has the excitation and we want to ask well, yeah we want to ask okay what's the probability that 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 excitation is measured after evolving by some amount s. Um, well, it turns out that you know because this projector squares to one, this probability uh, this probability can just be written as the norm squared of a particular state phi of s, uh, which we write in this way. Um, and in particular, the positive semi-definite nature of of um, of this generator uh, of this generator of the infalling evolution implies that this phi of s is just a it's a vector valued function and it can be continued to all values of s in the lower half complex s plane. So this is uh, because of this positive semi definite um, nature and it's also it's continuous along the the real s axis. But then uh, in that case we have Cauchy's theorem and that applies that we can't have a structure that looks like this. We can't have this bulk uh, what we expect from the bulk causal structure. Um, you know, if this if this function vanishes on this open interval on the real axis and it's analytic in the lower half plane, then that function has to be identically zero. Um, so we can't have this situation where it's it's vanishing on this on this interval on the on the on the real axis. So uh, you know, from the quantum mechanics description, from the CFT description, then um, we we can't have this form of the probability. The probability has to either you know only be zero at isolated points. Or it has to be identically zero, um, and so yeah. And I should mention this: this is an argument. Uh, it's an adaptation of an argument due to Hagerfeld um, in, from from a while ago. <laughs> Great, but of course we know that um, we know that you know there there should be this bulk geometry that has that sharp horizon, um, and so we have to ask: okay, well, how do we avoid you know this this no go argument for the non existence of this sharp horizon? Um, and and a clue comes to us just from you know from normal quantum field theory in Minkowski space time. So here I've drawn um, a Rindler decomposition of Minkowski space time. Um, I have you know I have a left wedge and a right wedge, a future wedge and a past wedge. Um, and you know this problem is is very very similar. It's very similar. Um, yeah, this this thermal field double case is very similar to this case of the Minkowski vacuum if we put it on a lattice. So if we imagine putting our field theory on a lattice, well then, you know, these degrees of freedom in the left wedge and, and in the right wedge, um, this Minkowski vacuum state is, is just like a thermal field double state for those of degrees of freedom. Um, but we also know that when we put, you know, when we put this theory on a lattice, the light combs are actually not sharp. If I try to have any, any notion of, you know, Minkowski time evolution, um, I, I won't find, I won't find sharp light cones. In fact, you know, There'll be there'll be some small tails um, in the commutators of evolved right operators with left operators, um, you know, for any value for any value of the amount of this time that I, that I've done. Um, but in the continuum limit, then we really do have these sharp light cones. Um, so somehow, you know, going to the, the continuum limit is, is showing a you know a sharp difference um, uh, between you know it, it you know allows the existence of these light cones, and and the reason for that. Is essentially because the nature of the operator algebras in this discretized case and in the continuum limit is is very different. You know, the operator algebras in the discretized case case are what's called type one von Neumann algebras, which are you know the usual von Neumann algebras that we encounter in quantum mechanics. Um, but in the continuum limit, these left and right algebras are actually of, of what's called type three one, um, and it turns out that these algebras of type three one. Uh, they just simply don't have those projection operators that we needed to make make the argument. Um, those, those you you can't make those kind of measurements uh, with the, just, you can't describe them with these projection operators in the type three one algebra. They simply don't exist, and this is very intimately related to the fact that you know there there's there's no Hilbert space associated to the right 
and to the left in the continuum limit. Um, that only arises in the discretized case. Great. Um, and so, and so, and so, why why does this tell us that you know at a finite number of degrees of freedom we can't have this sharp black hole horizon um, in the description? Well, it's essentially because you know at at um, we, we, we have you know, these, these sort of well-established dualities where you know, the right CFT describes the right exterior of the black hole, the left CFT describes the left exterior of the black hole. Um, but at, you know, at, at finite values of N, the only algebra that we have, have available to us on, on the right to describe you know, this full exterior is the full CFT algebra. And the full algebra of operators in the CFT is of type one, which means that those kinds of projectors do exist um, you know, there are there's such a thing, a thing as local measurement, and those kind of projectors exist. Um, and that means that the no-go argument applies, and we, we can't have this sharp horizon. Uh, you know, we can't have these commutators being exactly zero and then and then switching on to be non-zero. Hey, uh, Sam, yes. uh, does the no-go argument apply for uh, type two algebras? Because, uh, I mean, uh, the end of December paper from Witten, uh, he showed that it was it becoming it was becoming type two infinity. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. can one find some projector in such algebras? That's a good question. Um, I, I, yeah, so I, I, I'd have to think a little bit more about the nature of these um, projectors. So, so in that case, in that case, my suspicion is that is that the no-go argument does not apply for type two infinity. Um, yeah, because, because sort of to form those projectors to make that measurement, you need the notion of a local Hilbert space. Um, which you still don't have in type two infinity. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, great. So, 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 yeah. So, what this means um, is that at finite n, you know, the only algebras we have to describe these exterior regions, the only algebra, you know, full algebras that we have are these full CFT algebras, which are type one. This no-go argument applies, and and so we can't have a, a, you know an exactly sharp horizon. Um, and so that means that you know, in order to describe the notion of a horizon, we 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 have to actually sort of generalize our, our description of you know this infalling observer and the measurements that they'll make. Um, and so here I'll discuss um, this general horizon criterion. So again, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll remind you that we can't use you know th this idea of projectors because we might not have those in the algebra that we're using to describe these observers. Um, and so we need a new criterion. Um, and so, and so, you know, adapting um, there's a, there was there's a formula for for measuring you know local differences of states given by Buchholz and Ingvesen, um, and so adapting that to this scenario, um, we should consider this function. Um, and so, what this function basically does is it you know it scans over all possible operators I can find in the right theory. Not now we're not assuming that we have projectors that have have these properties that we want. Instead, we scan over all operators in the in the right theory. Um, and we ask, are any of the expectation values of those operators different um, with the insertion of this left, um, you know, this left unitary or, or uh, yeah, compared to when the left unitary is not insertion, in, inserted. Um, and so this criterion for a sharp horizon um, that also applies, you know, in this type three case um, is that, you know, instead of asking about that function P of S that we discussed previously, we should ask about this function F of S. Where we're scanning over all the possible operators in the in this right theory, um, and so the sharp horizon signature is that this f of s is identically zero before we cross the horizon, and then it can become non-zero after we cross the horizon after we've evolved by some parameter um, s, which is larger than you know this distance to the horizon. Um, great. So so that so that's uh, sort of the the story um, the story about no no sharp horizons at, at finite n. Um, and I'll just stop for a couple of seconds in case there are any questions before going on to talk about half-sided modular inclusion. Great, um, great. So, so now I'll just um, review a little bit about half-sided modular inclusion um, and, and some of this stuff hopefully is, is familiar from, from Hong's talk last Thursday, um, but, but I'll, I'll just uh, remind, remind everybody of this story. Um, so this slide is a bit abstract, but uh, essentially, uh, what what is a half-sided modular inclusion? Well, it's it's a structure that you may or may not you may or may not have in your operator algebra. So 
the, the way that it works is, is you start with a von Neumann algebra and a state. Um, and so this here is just sort of setting up some, some jargon. Um, if, we, if we have a von Neumann algebra and a state, and then if we act you know, all operators in that von Neumann algebra on the state, and then we take the set of all those states, if that set is dense in the Hilbert space, then we say that omega is cyclic for the algebra M. Um, and then similarly, another thing we can do is we can again act all those operators in the algebra on this on this state. And if it turns out that you know the only operator in that algebra that can annihilate the state is the zero operator, then we say omega is separating for M. And these cyclic and separating properties are, are essentially, uh, they're essentially the algebraic way to say that this state omega is a highly entangled state on this algebra M. And so there's a very familiar example um, of, of, of a cyclic and separating state, which is just the Minkowski vacuum. Um, you know, if I take a Rindler algebra, um, then uh, the Minkowski vacuum is cyclic and separating for that algebra. It's like highly entangled on, on the two sides of the, of the Rindler decomposition. Um, so then what's a half-sided modular inclusion? Um, well, it, in order to define this structure, we need to choose a subalgebra and, and you choose a subalgebra N of M and uh, you have to choose it in, to satisfy uh, two important properties. So the first is that this state omega has to still be cyclic. Um, so yeah, so the state omega I'm assuming is cyclic and separating for M. Um, and now I have to assume that, that for the subalgebra N, the state is still cyclic for N. So it's, it's, it's sort of trivially already still separating because N is a subalgebra, but the, the cyclicity is a bit more non-trivial. Um, and then moreover, um, it has to have this following property under modular flow with respect to M in this state omega. Um, so if I do the modular flow of all you know, these operators in this algebra N, I have to be contained within N for negative values of the parameter. Um, and so if I can find a subalgebra that has this special structure, then, um, then we have what's called a half-sided modular inclusion. And then, and then there's these theorems of Borchers and Wiesbrock that guarantee that this unitary group exists. There's this, there's this uh, you know, one parameter unitary group with a positive semi-definite generator. And moreover, that, that one parameter unitary group actually preserves the state omega for all values, for all real values of the parameter. Um, and it was later shown by Borchers that this kind of structure can only happen if this algebra M that I started with is a type three one von Neumann algebra. Um, and so, and so that's why it was so so important, um, as, as Hong mentioned last time, for us to find, um, you know, a type three one von Neumann algebra, to for us to find, you know, that algebra coming out of the CFT in this in this emergent way. Um, Can I ask a, a question? Yes. Let's say we are at finite n. Let's say n is is very large but finite. <clears throat> so the algebra is type one. Mm -hmm. Do you know in what sense uh, which part of this theorem breaks down, or in what sense it breaks down? Right. Um, yeah, that's 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 a good question. Um, right. So essentially, I think essentially, um, yeah. So, so yeah, I guess so. Maybe the maybe I can say just a few words about this the proof of this theorem. So. Yeah, the proof of the of the theorem um, essentially shows that that having um, having this kind of, of structure requires the the modular requires essentially requires the modular operator to have this continuous spectrum um, going along. Um, yeah, I guess for the modular operator along the entire positive real axis, um, and so I think it's that spectral condition that breaks down. Um, I wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I mean, presumably this breaks down in a mild way in the sense that the spectrum will be almost dense. It will be like mm -hmm. the gap will be exponentially small between energy eigenstates. So um, there should be some sense in which some aspects of the theorem continue to hold. Or, or... Right. I, yeah. So, so I guess, yeah, I guess I, I, yeah, I think, I think maybe at least my, my expect, my expectation is that is that you should be able to construct objects like U of S that sort of approximately have these properties. Um, yeah, I guess yeah. All of these theorems are stated for the exact case, and that's why they and that's why this type three one exists. And so yeah, it's a very interesting question of you know what exactly what do you have to impose? You know, if I have the type one case, is there some way I can choose that type one algebra such that I get an approximate version of this structure? Yeah.
Great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so all, all the statements basically that I'm going to make today are, are assuming, um, you know, it, you have these exact properties, uh, and it would be very interesting to understand what happens in the approximate case. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, so now um, I'll talk a little bit more about, about the, the modular properties of this group U of S. Um, so so there, there's more theorems by, by Borchers and Wiesbrock. Um, and so here, this is the other important theorem that I'll show is, is, is um, now, you know, now suppose that I have some unitary group U of S um, and, and um, it, it obeys this property that, you know, if I, if I do evolution by a negative value of the parameter, I preserve this big algebra M. Well, in that case, you can show that uh, any two of the following three properties will imply the third. So the first property is, a, is that the generator is positive semi-definite. The second property is that the vacuum, uh, you know, or the state omega is, is preserved um, uh, for, all, for all values of, of the parameter S. And then the third is that I have these, this sort of algebra with the modular operators. So, you know, for the modular operator, if I do the modular flow of U of S, I just get U at some new value of S. Um, and if I do the modular conjugation of U of S, I just get U at the negative value of S. Um, and so from the theorem I've just shown you, uh, we know that the U of S that we get from modular conjugation satisfies these first two properties, and therefore it must satisfy this third property as well. Um, and so these, this theorem sort of fixes the algebra that this, this, um, that this group of operators must satisfy with the modular operator and modular conjugation. Um, great. Um, and so, so, so these, these properties of U of S are all important because they're going to allow us to really uh, constrain U of S in the case that our algebra um, is a generalized free field algebra. Um, great. So here I'll just summarize all these properties of U of S that are gonna go into this next sort of more, more technical uh, part of the talk. Um, so the first thing is that, that the generator of U of S is Hermitian. So that's, uh, you know, like this, this unitary group. If I take the, the Hermitian conjugate, I just get it, uh, you know, I get uh, the same unitary group, but at the negative value of the parameter. Um, and all the applications that I'll discuss in the future, um, I'm going to be taking that state omega, that cyclic and separating state, to be the thermofield double. Um, and so those, you know, the preservation of the state omega it now turns into this preservation of the state, uh, the thermofield double for all values of the parameter. Um, as we just mentioned, we have this modular conjugation property that flips the sign of S. Um, the modular algebra tells us that the modular flow of U of S is just U at some new value of S. Um, and then finally, um, U of S was this one parameter group. You know, it's a, it's a unitary representation of the real line. Um, so if we multiply these operators, that's the same as taking, you know, the operator at the sum of, of those two values of the parameter. So, so these are these five properties that will all go um, into constraining U of S. Great. Um, and so, so, you know, so now uh, I want to talk about computing U of S in general. Um, and so the first thing that I'll emphasize is that those theorems of Borchers and Wiesrocks, they're existence proof. They tell you that, you know, if I can find this subalgebra N that has those special properties, then this U of S exists. Um, but they don't really tell you anything about, about how to construct it. Um, and, and in the completely general case, if I wanted to compute U of S in general, it's a very hard problem because I have to know the modular operator for both M and for N. And you know, there, 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 there are not very many cases where we, where we know the, the modular operator um, you know, very precisely. Um, but what we find is that in the case that this algebra M, this larger algebra that I start with is generated, generated by generalized free fields, then we can actually completely, we can show that this U of S has this universal form and it's completely fixed up to a phase factor. Um, and in particular, yeah, that, that phase encodes the choice of N. So, you know, so any one of these structures, uh, because U of S has all those nice properties that we talked about on the last slide, um, that completely fixes its form in this generalized free field case uh, up to some phase. And that, and yeah, and, and in fact, in, fix, in fixing that form, you don't even need to mention the, the subalgebra N, just those properties of U of S. Um, and so that phase sort of encodes the choice of N. Great. Um, so now I'll go over what's the calculation strategy that we're going to use. Um, 
And so the first thing and the thing that really makes this possible uh, for generalized free fields is that we'll see that this, this, um, these unitary operator U of S can be described by, by matrices or really, they're really infinite dimensional matrices and we're like linear maps. Um, but I might go back and forth saying matrices and, and linear maps. <laughs> um, and so we're gonna take two steps to compute U of S. Um, the first step is we'll show that that permissivity of the generator, the modular conjugation property and the invariance of the thermal field double under U of S. So those three properties together, they uniquely determine an extension of U of S from negative values of the parameter to positive values of the parameter. And so this is important because U of S for negative values of the parameter is a little bit simpler to understand because it actually preserves this algebra M. It doesn't mix this algebra M with anything else for negative values of the parameter. Whereas for positive values, we're going to get mixed with the commutant of M. Um, and, so, and so, yeah, so this, this extension uh, sort of allows us to focus only on the negative values of the parameter because we know how to extend it to positive values. Um, and then we'll, we'll sort of zoom in on this case where the parameter is negative, and we'll see that that group property, the fact that we have this you know, representation uh, of, of the you know, group of numbers on the real line, that modular algebra property, permissivity of the generator and invariance of the thermal field double again. So you know, all those properties are coming into it again. They completely fix the form of the matrix that describes U of S for negative values of S up to this phase. Um, great. So this is the strategy that we're going to take. Um, and before diving into that, um, I'll just uh, I'll just briefly uh, you know sort of uh, fix some notation on on generalized free fields and, and what do we mean by that. Um, so uh, in, in this discussion, I'll take this algebra M. I'm going to write it as M sub R. So you you can imagine that you know like this is the algebra of operators on the right side of the thermal field double, and its commutant is the algebra on the left. Um, and so then, so then uh, a generalized free field algebra is generated by operators that look like this. So they look a lot like a free field. So I have, um, you know, here's my operator, and then I have some coordinates on, on some space time manifold that I'm imagining studying my generalized free field on that manifold. Um, we have these mode functions u, um, and then we have basically these creation annihilation operators um, that I'll denote by a. Um, and so, uh, one important, uh, yeah, so, so just, yeah, to mention notation, I'm not going to write, I, I won't write a dagger anywhere um, in, in these uh, definitions of a, um, I guess, yeah, first, first I'll say the sum over momenta, what's different about a generalized free field from a free field uh, in this mode expansion is that uh, we also have to sum over independent values of, of the energy or frequency. Uh, you know, they're, they're, we don't uh, we don't have the energy or frequency determined by some in terms of the spatial momenta by some dispersion relation because we don't have an equation of motion. These generalized free fields don't satisfy that equation of motion, and so actually, you know, you have these independent degrees of freedom at different values of the frequency. Um, and um, there's a similar uh, mode expansion um, in in this left side, which is uh, I'll take to be related by the CPT conjugation. Um, so, you know, these, these sort of left mode functions that would appear, they're just given by, you know, these complex conjugates of those mode functions. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, one thing I meant to mention is that here, you know, in this mode expansion, I didn't write A and A dagger, um, you know, instead I, I just wrote it with a single K. So, you know, the, the Hermitian conjugation will take a, a, an operator of negative frequency to an operator of positive frequency and vice versa. Um, so that's sort of fixing the notation. Um, and then, okay, the very important part of generalized free fields is that the commutators are all complex numbers. If I look at the commutators of these operators, it's just a complex number. There's not a non-trivial operator on this side. Um, and this is sort of the hallmark of, of generalized free fields. Um, and so again, <laughs> fixing notation a little bit, I'll use these indices from the start of the Greek alphabet, alpha and beta. Those uh, take on the values like R and L, right and left. Um, and so the operators on the two sides commute with each other that's reflected by this delta alpha beta. Um, and then we have this sort of, you know, the usual commutation relations for, uh, for uh, creation and annihilation operators here. Um, as I mentioned, Hermitian conjugation is just going to flip the sign of the momenta. Um, and then modular conjugation acts, um, you know, in this well-known way, it exchanges this algebra M with its commutant. Um, 
And so in particular, yeah, the modular conjugation acts in this way on this position space operator. You know, it takes an operator, for example, on the right side to the same operator on the left, similarly a left operator to a right operator. So this sort of alpha bar notation is just to be interpreted as, you know, you take the opposite side. If I have R bar, that's equal to L, L bar is equal to R, um, you know. Um, and so this, this is sort of just fixing the notation that we'll use uh, to describe these generalized free fields. Um, and so now we have to define the thermofield double state. Um, and it's defined in this way. It's defined by, uh, oh, and I, one thing I should mention is I will always work in units where the inverse temperature is two pi. Um, and so that's why we'll have this e to the minus pi omega here. So the thermofield double states um, is, is the state that, you know, if I act with, you know, say a right, you know, a right annihilation operator, then that's the same as acting with a left creation operator up to some, up to some prefactor here that uh, depends on the temperature. But in this case, I'll just work in units where the inverse temperature is set to two pi. Um, and the reason this is important is it allows us to define operators that annihilate the thermofield double. So none of these, these A alphas, so no, none of these A rights or A lefts annihilate the thermofield double, but you know, we have to do this Bogolubov transform um, into operators that do annihilate the thermofield double. And so we define these operators in this way. And then for positive values of the frequency, those operators will annihilate the thermofield double. And you know, these operators are sort of, uh, it's you know, like the more, more familiar case where you're just quantizing about the Minkowski vacuum or something. You have annihilation operators that annihilate the state. Um, and creation oper operators that don't. Um, so now that all of this notation is fixed, um, we're going to we're going to describe the evolution. Sorry, can I ask of, you? Yes. Yes. Um, what was the function ep epsilon of k that you had in the previous slide? Yes. Good point. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I guess this is a, a non-standard. This Sorry, is just epsilon the of omega. Yeah. This this is just the sine function. So if omega is positive, it should give plus one. If omega is negative, it should give minus one. Um, yeah, these things just sort of appear because I've chosen not to write A and A dagger, but instead label by positive and negative frequency. But sorry, in the generalized free field, don't you have something like the dimension of the operator? Uh, um, it will be the mass of the, of the free field in the, in the bulk. Huh? Um, so, uh, so, so if for, for this description, yeah, for this description, the 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 mass yeah i guess um i guess maybe it's it's a, a point of, of normalization but the the mass or the dimension yeah so the mass and the bulk or the dimension of the operator is completely encoded in this function uk um i see yeah yeah okay great thanks. great thanks yeah um good um right so with these operators that, you know, I'll, I'll go, so, so yeah, one important thing is that, you know, these, these C operators and A operators, they're just a change of basis from each other. Um, and so, you know, if we can describe the evolution of the C operators, then we can do a basis transformation and we can describe the evolution of the A operators. Um, and um, and so, uh, so we'll, we'll want to describe the evolution of, you know, one set of these, of these oscillator operators. Um, using, uh, and we want to understand the evolution under this U of S, uh, this U of S that we get from the half-sided modular inclusion. Um, and, and in particular, because we get U of S from the half-sided modular inclusion, as I emphasized earlier, it has those five very important properties. Great. Um, and so, so um, here, here's an important, uh, an important part about generalized free fields. The fact that all those commutators were complex numbers means that, um, when I do the evolution of this operator under, under U of S, um, well, that just has to give me some new operator. But I actually have you know, a, a basis for those operators here. These, these A Ks or C Ks um, form a basis for these operators. And this is a very special property of, of generalized free fields. It's reflecting the nature that you know, they're free fields. Um, and so you know, basically all this statement is, is that the evolution of some operator is some other operator. And at this point, we don't know anything about the form of lambda or sigma. Um, these are these matrices that I discussed earlier that describe the evolution. And we'll see that we can really constrain the, these, these matrices um, all the way down uh, to, to being fixed all the way down to a phase. Um, great. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, as I mentioned here, 
Uh, yeah, I, you know, lambda and sigma, they're related by some basis transformation. They're just describing this transformation in different bases. Um, and they're completely fixed up to a phase by those conditions that U of S is known to satisfy. So the first condition is the hermicity of G. Um, so, you know, if I take this evolution and I do the, the, and I do the hermitian conjugation, um, I can either first expand, you know, in terms of sigma and C and do the hermitian conjugation, or I can take, you know, I can use that U of S dagger is equal to U of minus S. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, using and, and then do the expansion afterwards. Um, and then you, you'll get this equation. You'll find that sigma has to satisfy this property. You know, it's complex conjugate is the same as if I just reverse the signs of the momenta. Great. Then there's the modular conjugation property. Um, and that says that, you know, if, if you know, if I do the, the modular conjugation and if, if, you know, if I first do the expansion in terms of sigma versus, you know, using the fact that J, uh, you know, revert J squared is equal to one, that it reverses the sign of S, um, then I can, I can deduce from that this, this following condition that sigma has to satisfy. So if I take a complex conjugate, this essentially is coming from the fact that J is anti-unitary, um, then, um, then that has to be the same as if I, you know, reverse the right and left sides, and then also take this parameter to be negative. Um, so this is just these are just some properties that the, these matrices have to satisfy. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about this thermal field double invariance. So that was the idea that U of S for any real value of the parameter S has to preserve this thermal field double state. Um, and in, yeah, in, in particular, what that means is that now if I act with an evolved one of these CK oscillators, well, U of S preserves the, the thermal field double state. That's what's appearing on the right hand side. So the C alpha K still annihilates the thermal field double for positive frequency. Um, and so I, I still have to get zero when I evolve this operator. Um, and so, yeah, so in particular, the fact that the evolution preserves the thermal field double means that it cannot mix the positive and negative frequency C-type oscillators, those, os those are the oscillators that are like the annihilation and creation oscillators um, for the thermal field double. So this allows us to, to, to you know, decompose this matrix sigma into a very specific form. There's one matrix A, which parameterizes you know, how if I evolve uh, an operator of positive frequency, how does it mix with other operators of, of positive frequency? And similarly, another matrix B um, that tells us if I evolve an operator of negative frequency, how does that mix with other negative frequency operators? Um, and so these, these sort of important properties of sigma, it turns out that you can look at all those properties and put them together um, and, and, find that, uh, and find that sigma for, for S uh, positive can be completely determined in terms of sigma for negative values of S. Um, and so then the last thing that I'll, I'll recall about um, about u is that it's preserving this algebra m for negative values of the parameter. Um, so if I if I do this evolution by negative value of the parameter, then I have to stay within the algebra. Um, and so uh, what this means um, what this means thinking about those a oscillators again, which lived either in the right or the left algebra. Uh, what this means is that if I take a right oscillator of some of some you know quantum numbers k. If I evolve it by a negative value of the parameter, um, then it's overlapped with a left oscillator of any, you know, any quantum numbers k prime. For negative values of the parameter, that has to be exactly zero. Otherwise, I would have mixed. Um, otherwise, I, you know, I would, I wouldn't have this property up here. I would have mixed the right algebra with the left algebra um, for negative values of the parameter. Um, and so, what we'll do is we'll just define um, you know, this, this matrix C now without any of these right or left labels to be the matrix that describes the evolution of these right, right oscillators for S, uh, for S negative, because we know that they're not going to mix. Um, we know that they're not going to mix with any of the left oscillators for negative values of the parameter. Um, and so with, with all of these properties um, that, that U of S has to satisfy, um, and taking uh, th those conditions on the matrices that I, that I just showed on the last two slides, uh, that hermic hermicity of G, modular conjugation, and invariance of the thermal field double, will determine sigma in terms of this C, K, K prime of S, which is only defined for negative values of S. And in this way, we extend US from its, um, from its, its negative value of S uh, you know, description 
to all values of S just from those properties that we know U of S must satisfy. Um, and so here I'll just, I, I won't go into any detail about this, but this is just um, a, you know, a picture of that full extension of U of X. So here, um, so here I've described it in terms of these lambda matrices, but, uh, but you know, as you can see, um, you know, if I take this lambda right, right, well, that was by definition, this C of K, K prime for negative values of S, but you know, any other possible values I could have chosen um, for alpha and beta or for K and K prime all, all, and, and for different values of S, those are all determined in terms of this, you know, this single, uh, this single matrix C K K prime um, in this way. And so this is sort of the solution of, of all those properties that extends U of S from negative values of the parameter to positive values of the parameter. Great. So that's the first, uh, the first step in, in you know, constraining uh, what, what form this U of S has to take. Um, and so the second step is to determine uh, what can we say about this C K K prime matrix that described the, you know, the evolution of these operators for negative values of the parameter. Um, so we have this group property that tells us, you know, that if we take this product, it's the same as the sum. And we have this modular algebra property that tells us the modular flow of U of S is U at some other, um, at some other value of S. And this actually will completely fix C K K prime up to a phase. Um, so the first thing that we have to note is that the modular flow in this thermal field double states, um, you know, the modular flow for these left or right oscillators is actually just a time translation. It acts as a time translation uh, in the following way. So if I do the modular flow of this, of this oscillator here, I pick up this phase uh, in front um, and it just, like a, just like you would expect for a time translation. Um, and in particular here, there's a bit of an abusive notation. This alpha, if it's right, should be interpreted as a plus one. If it's left, it should be interpreted as a negative one. That's just reflecting the fact that the left theory is a time reversal of the right theory. Um, so the time's running in opposite directions. Um, and so then we can play the same game. Um, we can play the same game with, with this modular property. So we take you know, the, modular, the modular flow of, uh, of this operator and either we can do our expansion in terms of the matrix, uh, the matrix first and take the modular flow after using this equation, or we can use this modular property and first you know, do the modular flow of U of S um, and then do the expansion afterwards. Um, and, and all that boils down to this equation here at the bottom, um, which is a, which very, you know, it, it completely fixes the S dependence of this matrix lambda. So, right, so the, this matrix lambda, you know, the, the only difference in terms of the, these uh, two, two matrices is the, is the, you know, the value of this S parameter that we're at. Um, and, and, and that, you know, changing that S parameter has to change the phase in this way. It has to, you know, change us from this alpha omega on this side to this beta omega prime on this way side. So this is very constraining property on the S dependence of this matrix lambda. Um, and in fact, it completely fixes it um, to take the following form. So it, it has to take, it has to be of the form S to some complex power, you know, involving the various sides. Um, and then uh, you know the the frequency the two frequencies in this way, um, and then if you trace that back to the the mapping to C K K prime, this tells us um, that the the S dependence of C has to be of this form. So that's the the S dependence of this matrix C K K prime of S is completely fixed to be of this form. So can I just oh, yes just to fix the uh, so. All this you could just state in Minkowski Rindler for a free field, right? More or less. Um, right. So, so, um, so, so, yeah. So, if you, if you if you look at like the the Rindler decomposition um, of Minkowski for for a free field, um, then uh, yeah, then then you'll you'll find the evolution matrices look exactly like this. Yeah, if that was the no, so just to understand in that context. So, so sorry. So K and K prime are. So you are in how many dimensions? Uh, so, so this is uh, it, it's yeah. I guess it's it's, it's general at this point. I, I haven't said anything about the the manifold that I'm working on. Um, uh, so, so K so, and K prime are vectors. Or, sorry. Yeah. So, so they they could be vectors, but it also could be um, like you know if I have uh, if I have like a boundary cylinder, um, then you know I, I I can have angular momenta and then maybe a frequency associated with the time direction. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they're they're um, 
they're just sort of general quantum numbers that are characterizing the, the manifold you're working on, yeah. So Samuel, can I also ask a question? Mm -hmm. Uh, you started this uh, discussion by um, writing down the um, evolution of uh, mode. And on the right-hand side, you had a linear relationship with A. So there was sigma times A. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we do not have any additional uh, higher order terms, I guess can be understood by the intuition that the modular Hamiltonians for M and N um, are effectively quadratic in the, um, in the operators, right? Yes, yeah, that's true, yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. So that, yeah, that will guarantee that we don't generate those terms and, and then that's guaranteed by this sort of free field nature of, uh, yeah, of this problem, yeah. Okay. Great. Okay, but can you please translate everything, let's say for Rindler and Minkowski in two dimensions, let's say, okay, so K and K are any dimension. Right, right, right. Um, so, so U of S is like, a some deformation of the Minkowski evolution, time evolution, whereas the modular flow, so M is like the right Rindler wedge? Uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, you can imagine, yeah. So an example of this is to choose M as the right Rindler wedge. Right Rindler yes, wedge yeah. And then the modular flow is like the Rindler evolution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with the T, T being the Rindler time. Okay, okay. And S is like the Minkowski time or but some deformation of, you know. It, it, yeah, so, so S is like, the, it, yeah, S is, is, is like the Minkowski time. The, the simplest example of this is, is to, um, yeah, I, I should have mentioned that. The simplest example of this is to take the, the Rindler wedge, take M to be that algebra, yeah. then just shift the Rindler wedge by, uh, by a null translation in like the U direction. Just shift that down and then take the algebra in that region. Um, and, um, and that's N. So under the modular flow, which was the boost about the origin, then that that shifted uh, that shifted Rindler wedge is preserved under the boost about the origin by negative values of the boost of the Rindler time, um, and then what you find the U of S that you get from that procedure is actually just a pure null translation along the Minkowski U direction. That's right. Yeah, that that uh, that picture I remember. No, I'm not trying to understand why these matrices are universal in that picture. I mean, there must be some easy way to see this. Yeah, why? Okay, so that is, why is it so uniquely determined up to a phase? Right, I, I guess, um, I think because the, the form of this U of S has to satisfy all, all these properties. Um, so so it's, it's a very special form of evolution operator. Um, yeah, so in this example, you're saying that the U of S can only be this null translation um, no. So, so yeah, so, so yeah, so yeah, I guess, yeah, maybe what I was saying is that in, in that, in that example for those choices, U of S is a null translation, but I might be able to choose some different choice of subalgebra. Um, and then I might, and then uh, of subalgebra that I'm using to construct this half-sided modular inclusion. And if I choose a, a different choice, then I might not get um, a U translation uh, of, of U of S. Um, but the, the matrix description of the form will look exactly like this, um, except the phase will be different. Um, so even though the new U is not really a null translation, or is it a null translation up to a phase? Um, ah, so so yeah, so 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 this this it doesn't have to be a null translation. Ah, because um, you are yes, working yeah. on some different basis of key and uh, I mean of these uh, E and E dagger operators. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, maybe the, the simplest examples are these are these null translations, um, but it, do, it doesn't have to be a null translation, yeah. Um, but nevertheless, these matrices are determined up to a phase. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, these, these A operators, yeah, these A operators might be some very strange object that we don't, don't usually talk about, yeah. Um, great. Um, great. Um, so now, um, so now that we fixed this S dependence, um, we'll, we'll assume that, that, uh, you know, this evolution preserves the angular momenta or the transverse momenta. Um, so yeah, whatever are these sort of spatial momenta on the manifold. Um, 
we'll assume that, that it preserves those, those transverse momenta and then see kk prime, the S dependence is fixed. So all that's left is some function G of k and k prime. Um, well, then you can go through, um, you can go through, you know, plugging this into, uh, into the fact that, you know, U of S times U of S prime is the same as U of S plus S prime. So into that group property. And then you get some equation that looks like this. And this is actually a very stringent constraint, constraint on G of K and K prime. Um, and it's solved by, um, by, by this taking G of K and K prime to have this form. So we take, choose some function lambda, now just have a single momentum. You know, we choose uh, the same function and we put it in the denominator for k prime. And then there's this gamma function uh, that appears. And if we take this form, then we're guaranteed to satisfy that group property. Um, and then the hermicity of the generator G, um, well, if you, if you track you know, those properties through all these definitions, what you'll find is that you know taking the complex conjugate, I have to get the negative values of the momenta, and so now translating into you know this new parameterization of the function, then we we have to get this property of the lambda function, and then finally the thermofield double invariance. Well, what this says is that you know if I evolve these oscillators um, for some value of s that's negative, um, which is what we're considering here. Well, if I evolve them by the same value of s, the thermofield double is invariant, so that had better not change this two-point function. And if you you know you go through plugging in this parameterization of u of s, what you'll find is that this implies that lambda k times lambda minus k has to be equal to this one over two cinch factor. Um, so after all of that, um, after plugging in all those properties and looking at those equations, um, you find that lambda k has to take this form. And this is this phase that I was talking about. The fact that we've only determined the evolution up to a phase, we're still allowed to put an arbitrary phase here in that form. Um, and then that's reflected in this C K K prime, this matrix that's describing the, the, the evolution for negative values of S um, in this way. It's, it's reflected in this sort of arbitrary phase um, that can appear in front. Um, and that phase sort of encodes the choice of the subalgebra N. Um, so just sort of going through this, um, you know, from the right to the left, we, we assumed that we were going to be diagonal in the transverse momenta. So we have this, uh, we're, we're conserving those transverse momenta. This uh, gamma function factor comes from the fact that we want to satisfy this group property. Um, we want, you know, we want this, uh, we want the product of the two evolutions to give us the evolution at the sum of the two parameters. Um, this minus S is fixed by the modular uh, properties that U of S had to satisfy this S dependence. Um, and then this this square root of the cinch factors, that um, that's determined by this, this invariance of the thermal field double under this evolution. Um, and so putting that all together, uh, putting the two parts together, we have we have you know this form of lambda, which is describing this this evolution u of s. So lambda is completely determined from c k k prime of s, and then this is the general form that c k k prime has to take which is completely fixed up to this phase. Great. Um, so are there any questions about that? Uh, that's, that's sort of the, the roadmap of this calculation. Great. So now I'll just quickly uh, go over some, some applications uh, uh, before concluding. Uh, so, so the first application is, is, as Hong mentioned last time, so now if, if we take you know, these generalized free fields on the boundary, remember that these generalized free fields don't satisfy an equation of motion. They're independent operators at, independent, at, at different times here. So this N is a genuine subalgebra. And so now we know that we have a generalized free field theory on the boundary. We have a half-sided modular inclusion. So that U of S by the calculation we've just done is completely constrained up to this phase. Um, but computing that phase in general can be difficult. So the way that we compute it is, is we conjecture that you know, this algebra of operators below this fixed time slice is, is described by the algebra of operators at some uh, you know, cutoff at some Kruskal U coordinate. And then you can actually compute that that phase has to be given by the phase shift of these bulk fields at the horizon. And so now that we've computed the phase, we've completely fixed U of S. And it's that choice of U of S that gives rise to this Kruskal U-like translation, taking us from the right uh, into the future. And, or, 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 you know, alternatively, you can draw it in terms of Cauchy slices over here. Um, and with that U of S, we can generate 
those interior regions uh, from the exterior regions uh, in this way, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then one, one thing that, that's important in all of this is that um, this, uh, remember that, that U of S just was, was uh, required us to choose a nice uh, choice of subalgebra N. It turns out that, that you know, in this black hole case, there's actually an infinite number of choices that we can make for that subalgebra N. So there's an infinite number of the, those evolution operators that we can find. Um, and so I'll just conclude with some future directions related to this work. Um, so the first thing is that one crucial feature of our work was the emergence of this type three one algebra. And we'd like to better understand the emergence of that type three one structure at, at large N. Uh, and, and, and specifically, we'd like to understand this, you know, in, in some more concrete uh, models, like maybe the SYK model, um, how exactly does that, does that transition happen from this type one algebra to the type three one? Uh, we'd like to better understand the role of bulk singularities um, now that we have this evolution of operators that 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 can go and, and hopefully probe the singularity, we'd like to better understand um, how do we see the singularity from the boundary theory. Um, we'd like to apply this framework to emergent symmetries, symmetries in the SYK model, and also and also you know near horizon symmetries. Um, and finally, we'd like to study you know the emergence of the black hole interior from these single-sided black holes using this kind of structure. Um, so thanks very much for your attention, uh, and I'm happy to answer any more questions. Thank you, Sam. And thanks, thanks. a lot for your talk. <laughs> there are any more questions? Sorry, can I ask a question? Yep. Um, so, um, if instead of the thermophile state, we start with another state where there is a unitary on the left side, uh, some mm -hmm. particle. Um, I guess this formalism will give you a different uh, G, mm -hmm. which seems to uh, sort of contradict what you would calculate from effectively here in the bulk, where the uh, evolution operator for a, from the right wedge into the future wedge uh, is, is a fixed operator independent of the state that you're considering. And like for example, in Minkowski space, um, maybe this light cone translation is the mm -hmm. correct generator that uh, you know moves the observer through mm -hmm. the ring horizon. But if you try to reproduce it via this uh, formalism, you would get a different result depending on what unitaries you have acted with on the left side. It, right. Do you have any right. way of, let's say, removing this? Um, uh, oh, or defining some criteria under which you should uh, use this G as the physical time evolution. So, so yeah. So I, I think, I, yeah, we, we don't. Um, we yeah. I guess I would say yeah. We don't. We don't have a, a criterion for for choosing a particular U as the physical ev evolution. So as I mentioned at, at the end, there's an infinite number of choices for this for this U. And one one uh, yeah one way is exactly as you've mentioned. If I act if I act some small unitary on the left. Um, then, then I get a, a value. Yeah, I get a new, um, I get a new generator G, which is related basically by conjugation of that unitary. Um, and so, right, as long as that unitary is, is small enough that it doesn't destroy the, the bulk geometry. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But my, so, my 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 comment here is that um, if you look at the uh, the time evolution from the bulk point of view, from effective mm -hmm. theory in the bulk, you would expect that uh, the operator, that the unitary that will uh, transform, um, a, you know, a local operator on the right side mm -hmm. to an operator behind the horizon, the operator itself should be independent of the presence of a U left or, or not, whether you have a U left on the other side or not. While this mathematical formalism predicts that J transforms by this conjugation by the unitary on the left. Right. Um, so okay. So 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 okay. So are you, are you imagining we, we have we have a preferred evolution? So for example, in the bulk, we could say we just want to evolve by crucible time. Exactly. Some, some crucible time, and exactly. we evolve. Right. Okay. Um, right. Yeah. So so yeah. So in this case, uh, I, I think yeah, you will still. Well, mm -hmm. Or, or maybe yeah, you'll, you'll say it a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, uh, this formalism, for example, predicts that the state itself, so the mm -hmm. state you start with, is invariant under evolution with U. 
mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which sort of makes sense maybe for the thermophile state, <coughs> which is a, well, there are no excitations on the exterior, but if you take an excitation with a state with excitations outside the black hole that will fall in, mm-hmm. why would we expect this to be invariant under U from a physical point of view? Um, right, I guess, I guess maybe, um... I, I think maybe, maybe I guess yes from our perspective these different choices of yeah these different possible uh, evolutions are, are describing different possible families of observers falling into the bulk and so I think you you might not um, mm-hmm. you, you might not I guess expect them yeah they, they won't all have the same evolution operator I okay. think um, yeah yeah <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I, I have a similar, I mean, yeah, this, the, the you annihilating, yeah, leaving the state invariant. Yeah, if I just think in Minkowski space or sounds like a strong requirement, right? I mean, it's mm-hmm. not generically, for a gen, I mean, except for the vacuum, it's not true actually for any other state. Right. So how come this requirement is so central to your construction? Um. Right. Yeah. I guess. Um, yeah. That, that's that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. So I guess it's it's it's. I guess for, from our perspective, it's it's more of a, a, a. It was a requirement that came out of. It's a property that came out of out of these theorems of of, of Borchers and Wiesbrock. Um, that that you do uh, you do preserve the state with the evolution. Um, but, but I guess you, you could apply it. I mean, before going to holography, right? Suppose you just try mm-hmm. to apply it in Minkowski space. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm just trying to imagine if you take instead of the Minkowski vacuum, if you take a slightly excited state, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. can you find how can you how can the time evolution operator of any kind annihilate this state? Um, I mean, no, not a night. I mean, leave it invariant. Right. Um, so I think in in that case, um, I mean, you could run yeah. this Borchert's uh, theorem on a mm-hmm. simple try. I mean, simple example of uh, like this Bisonian. I mean, the, for Riddler observer, right? Just do it for Riddler observer. Mm-hmm. Then um, how should I think about? I mean, there must be a way to think yeah. about it. I'm just trying to understand. Mm-hmm. In the context right. of Lindler, yeah. Right. So I guess um, so maybe yeah, yeah. So in the context of Rindler, I mean um, I guess right, yeah, one one yeah, one crucial input. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, one one crucial input, I guess, was that we were in a thermal state as as seen by the Riddler observers. Um, and right, and using um, Right, and so that's that's why when we I guess if we purify that state to the thermal field double, then we end up with that. Um, uh, if you were slightly excited right. over the thermal state, then that's not. Um, so so yeah, so if you're if you're sort of I mean yeah so if, yeah so if you're so yeah so say you you can apply some some maybe some some small unitary to to give you um, these excitations. Um, then, um, then yeah, then this construction still goes through, but you'll get a new generator. And I, I mean, essentially, the generator transforms simply. So maybe this is the answer. If, if I apply some small unitary, so imagine I apply some small unitary to excite the Minkowski vacuum a bit, um, and then I run through this construction. What I find is that this, this new generator G is basically related to the old generator G by conjugation by that unitary. So essentially, the preservation of that state is just the preservation of the vacuum again. But I've, I have to take off the unitary, uh, you know, annihilate the vacuum, and then apply the unitary again. Uh-huh. You are only imagining unitary. But suppose I just take Minkowski and act with an A dagger, yeah, one particle state. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not um, achieved by a unitary. Right. Um, yeah. In that case, I guess I would have to think more carefully about. The properties of that state. Um, I see, I see. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. 
um yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's Can I ask one more technical thing? Uh, you, you mentioned that this phase that you found for the <laughs> matrix uh, that you had C or, or sigma mm -hmm. was the same as the phase of the phase shift of the fields uh, near the horizon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is, is there a is there any way to understand that uh, without do, going through the calculation or, or? Um, right, yeah, that, that's. Um, is there any intuitive yeah. <laughs> um, uh, explanation of this? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, is there an intuitive way to understand that? Um, So I think I think essentially so 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 an important feature I guess of this U of S right is that or, or of G maybe is that it's S independent. Um, so we have the same U of S everywhere in the bulk, and basically what that means is we can study what these null evolutions look like in the near horizon limit, mm -hmm. um, and then in that case you get the phase shift showing up. So I see. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sam. For a very nice talk. Uh, great. Thanks. So, thanks yeah. so much for all the questions. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> thanks.